Good evening. My name is Christopher Geisler. I'm the director of the John Hay Library and Special Collections, and I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to the library this evening. Uh, the library is very pleased to welcome Sylvia Brown, who will share with us her work uh, investigating and uh, tearing apart kind of uh, the, the legacy of philanthropy and uh, the entanglements that that has brought. Um, uh, specifically, as she's you know, investigated in her work grappling with legacy, Rhode Island's Brown family, and the American philanthropic impulse. As a descendant of Nicholas Brown, one of the four Brown brothers who were instrumental in forming Brown University and bringing the campus to Providence, Sylvia is well known to many of us across the campus and to the local community. She earned her bachelor's and master's degrees at the University of Pennsylvania, and over the past decade, she has pursued a career in international development even as she spent countless hours researching and writing her recent book. In particular, Sylvia has worked with donors on their personal giving strategies and with nonprofits on improving their sustainability and board governance. Uh, Sylvia's own personal philanthropy has focused on her family's long-standing interest in the history and heritage of uh, including Brown University and on the impact <laughs> on the impact investment sector in Rhode Island, where she's a director of the Social Enterprise Greenhouse. In 2015, Sylvia launched Uplifting Journeys, an immersive donor education program to empower anyone, anywhere, to give more thoughtfully and more strategically. Sylvia's generosity has not been limited to providing financial support and advice. She's a scholar of high standing whose research results in important gives to the world recording and reflecting on the history of what it means to us and examining the concept of the university as an agent of social change. Uh, following this uh, Sylvia's talk, I'd like to welcome you to join us downstairs for a reception and conversation with Sylvia and her husband, Andrew West. Uh, and there will be books available, and uh, Sylvia also will be available to sign. So please well, join me in welcoming Sylvia. Thank you so much. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here and a bit of a novelty for me because I spend a fair amount of time a little higher up on the hill at the JCV Library. Um, I'm a little less familiar with the hay, although I did do quite a bit of research here uh, in the old days when it was a bit dark and musty and now it's glorious. So it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Last year, American institutions of higher education received $44 billion, and in the past few years, Harvard and Stanford have received a billion dollars a year. Why, why do Americans give so much to higher education? Well, there's some obvious answers. Gratitude. For many people, the university is the single greatest influence in a lifetime, and cynics will tell you that the advancement departments of universities are fundraising machines that you can't escape. But also, we in America believe in the transformational nature of universities. We see universities as agents of social change. And we see giving to a university as an investment in the future, which explains why most of the $100 million gifts are given to just a handful of schools. I would like to posit that this way of thinking started right here on this spot 200 years ago, well before the Gilded Age and well before the start of modern philanthropy. And to understand how momentous this was, we need to look at America's tradition of giving over the past four centuries. And to do that, I would like to suggest that we look at the evolution of my own family over 400 years. Let's start with John Winthrop and his famous 1630 sermon aboard the Arabella on its way to Massachusetts Bay Colony. Now, Winthrop believed firmly in a social hierarchy based on economic inequality. He wrote about the obligations of the rich towards the poor and he wrote about the need to reconcile this economic inequality with a spiritual equality by balancing the good of the individual with the good of the community. 
But he wrote that disparities of wealth were divinely ordained so that men would have more need of each other. Think about how far we've come uh, in our thinking today about altruism and social equality. Then 80 years later, in his sermon, Essays to Do Good, Cotton Mather wrote that private charity could, quote, harmonize the competitive and conflicting interests of a rapidly changing society. So how did these principles apply to colonial society? Well, let's look at the Brown family. The Browns arrived in Rhode Island in 1638. Chad Brown was a harness maker from uh, Northamptonshire, and he arrived in Boston, but within six months realized he couldn't stand the dictatorship of the Puritan fathers. He heard about a little settlement to the south called Providence that had been founded two years earlier by Roger Williams, and so decided to join him. Very rapidly, he assumed a position of responsibility. He was one of the men who drew the first lots in Providence that you see here, and he led the group in worship along the precepts of the Baptist faith. And then nothing much happened for a hundred years. But four generations later, uh, Chad's uh, great-grandson, James, asked one of the few men in town with a dock and a few ships and a beautiful daughter for his daughter's hand in marriage. <coughs> and then he convinced his new father-in-law to finance a voyage to the West Indies and came back with a cargo full of sugar and molasses and rum and opened a small shop. And the rest, as we say, is history. And by the time of the revolution, James's four sons had a network trading all up and down the eastern seaboard with the Caribbean and with London. But their real genius was that they understood value added. They took the few products that the British allowed them to manufacture and traded those. So instead of just selling rum, they bought molasses and turned it into rum. They bought the byproducts of whale oil and turned them into candles. And here you see their label, which was the first product label in America. They discovered iron ore in northern Rhode Island and built a furnace and produced iron bars. And they also got involved in a number of activities which we would consider illegal today, if not frankly immoral smuggling, privateering, slave trading, cornering the tobacco market, insider trading. But once they'd reached commercial success, their number one issue was how to be considered gentlemen. Because in the 18th century, a gentleman was someone who didn't have to work, who could depend entirely on the products of his land. Now, in the colonies, the only people who could really do that were the southern planters who had land and slave labor. But in New England, everybody was involved in trade. Everybody had to have a foot in the counting house. And so how did the Brown brothers resolve this conundrum and be considered gentlemen? Well, they started by getting a coat of arms and by buying uh, beautiful goods um, and furniture, and then they built themselves beautiful homes like the Joseph Brown House on South Main Street and the John Brown House on Benefit Street. But that was not enough because according to John Winthrop and Cotton Mather, a virtuous man had to care for the good of the community. So how could the Browns show that they were gentlemen of public responsibility? Well, the first step is they had the streets paved and lit. They brought the first fire engine to Providence. They started the first primary school, and they served in the legislature, where they had no qualms about bribing voters and rigging the vote. And then they went one step further. They endowed Providence with three of its greatest landmarks, the College of Rhode Island's University Hall in 1771, the Market House in 1773, and the First Baptist Church in 1775. And I want to use this opportunity to say that the Browns did not found Brown University. It was started by the Baptist Society of Philadelphia in 1764 in Warren, Rhode Island. And only after it had proved successful did it want to move to a more cosmopolitan location. 
there was a great competition between Newport and Providence, and the Browns made sure that Providence won by offering the land and money and building University Hall. But at that time, it was very much called the, the College of Rhode Island and was funded through donations from all up and down the eastern seaboard. Now, what's important to remember is that none of this was altruism. At best, it was self-interested benevolence meant to benefit the commercial ventures and the reputation of the Brown family. The growth and economic success of Providence directly advance the interests of the Brown brothers. We are years away, again, from the altruism and equality of opportunity that we consider so important today. In the 1770s, no one conceived of a society that was not hierarchical. In fact, the great American theologian, Jonathan Edwards, wrote, all have their appointed office, place, and station according to their several capacities and talents, and everyone keeps his place and continues in his proper business. Into this very hierarchical colonial society uh, was born a little boy, Nicholas Jr., the son of the eldest of the four Brown brothers. His father's name was also Nicholas, and you will see that in my family we're not very original, and everybody's named Nicholas, or John <laughs> Nicholas. Nicholas Jr. was born in 1769 in the house you see here on South Main Street, which doesn't exist anymore. And he was born at a time when his father and uncles were at the height of their success as colonial merchants. But unfortunately, his childhood was marked by tragedy. He had 10 siblings, only one of whom survived, as you can see in this family Bible. And he also lost his mother at a young age. More importantly, he grew up during the War of Independence. He was three years old when his uncle John Brown burnt the British revenue cutter Gatsby. And he grew up uh, in the stress and turmoil of a war. He attended the College of Rhode Island and graduated in 1786 in the first class to graduate after the war. But his family at the time was teetering on the edge of bankruptcy because America was going through a terrible economic depression. And so this very stressful childhood and youth left John Nicholas with a visceral craving with law and order. When his father died, he was 22. But fortunately, he had two remarkable uncles. One John launched Rhode Island into the China trade and was constantly experimenting with new ventures. He was the consummate capitalist who believed that a merchant should be free to do anything he wanted, including slave trading. And the other uncle was Moses, who had a brilliant mind, who launched Rhode Island into textile manufacturing because he was looking for a way to employ the widows and orphans of the war. And he had a very strong social conscience. He became a Quaker and one of America's first major abolitionists. Young Nicholas ended up following his uncle John in business and his uncle Moses in social matters. Nicholas was passionate about maritime trade, and so he plunged into the China and Java trades as well and did extremely well. Some of his voyages made a 300% profit. He also invested in the new nation, in banking, in infrastructure investments like turnpikes and canals and later railroads and lands out west. And he also had a strong social conscience influenced by his uncle Moses. He was vice president of the Providence Abolition Society and supported many free black causes in Providence. He supported the College of Rhode Island, which was renamed Brown University in 1804, following a $5,000 gift he made. And he followed the general vogue for causes that, pro that promoted morality. He gave large sums to the Baptist church and other churches, to missionary societies and Bible societies and so forth. None of that was very original. But in the early 19th century, America was undergoing a revolution, a complete transformation of society. 
the orderly rural economy of the colonial era was being replaced by an industrial economy with bustling cities, with factories, with immigrants streaming in across the Atlantic, with populations moving out west, and of course with increased opportunity became a desire for increased egalitarianism. A religious revival swept the country called the Second Great Awakening, which preached man's spiritual equality before God and also moral reform and improving society. A new middle class sprung up of shopkeepers and artisans <coughs> who were the moral guardians of a meritocracy based on hard work. Self-discipline replaced the traditional deference to authority. And so the notion of the disinterested gentleman who didn't have to work became completely obsolete. America became the redeemer nation of a middle class that believed that correct moral principles would achieve social stability. And so thousands of Bible societies and missionary societies and Sunday schools sprung up a temperance movement took over the country, and alcohol consumption dropped by two-thirds by 1840. And out of the temperance movement sprang an abolition movement in the 1830s, which preached immediate emancipation. But telling people to go to church and read the Bible was obviously not the solution to social problems. Politics became increasingly vicious, and the election of 1828 was one of the most bitter in American history. Andrew Jackson called himself a man of the people and invited the public into the White House, but was also considered a ruthless dictator and an absolute monarch. And as the number of dispossessed factory workers and immigrants grew, social tensions increased. They were constant riots. Many of them were racially motivated. As I said earlier, young Nicholas's traumatic childhood and adolescence gave him a craving for law and order. He longed for a return to the orderly, hierarchical society of the colonial era. He believed passionately that if men could trade with each other, they would live at peace with each other. And yet, Andrew Jackson, in the mid-1820s, imposed very high import tariffs, which were helpful to Rhode Island's factories, but which destroyed maritime trade. Worse, Nicholas's own sons were rebelling against their father. The eldest, also called Nicholas, left Providence, slamming the door behind him, moved to New York, and said his father was a gray-haired juggernaut, a lunatic who should be locked up for giving so much money away. His daughter, Anne, said she preferred writing letters to her father than speaking with him. And his younger son, John Carter, referred to his father as Mr. Brown in his diary all the way until the last year of his father's life, when finally he used the words, my father. He stayed on in Providence, but very reluctantly. So here was Nicholas II, uh, extremely successful in business, but watching the world that he knew and, and cared for disintegrating around him and worse, seeing his sons who refused to follow in their father's footsteps. So what did he do? He turned to the one institution he could still influence, the university that bore his name. America's leaders needed a moral compass, he felt, a set of values to guide them through the era's stormy seas. And at least he could make sure that the young men who attended Brown University had that moral compass. He brought in a new president, Francis Wayland, who ruled with an iron fist for 28 years. And he poured money into new buildings, a library, and scientific equipment. But he insisted that the curriculum emphasize the classics and liberal arts rather than the practical curriculum that was becoming so popular. Because he believed that only the liberal arts could reconcile men with what was going on in society and imbued them with Christian beliefs and a high sense of social responsibility, capable of making a positive contribution to society. And I believe that those values persist to this day at Brown University. 
Now, I'm not making a value judgment about Nicholas Brown's philanthropy. Seen through 21st century eyes, it seems rather patronizing. But in the early 19th century, these gifts to Brown University were pathbreaking. No one until then had viewed a university as an agent of social change, a concept that's become an intrinsic part of our American ethos. No one had given so much money to a university in their lifetime for purely altruistic re reasons to forge a generation of future leaders. At the end of Nicholas's life, people's view of charity started changing, and Americans started thinking of preventing social evils rather than just curing them. A new breed of philanthropists sprung up who not only funded but actively participated in assisting segments of society that had been neglected. So for example, Thomas Gallaudet worked with the deaf mutes, Samuel Gridley Howe with the blind, Dorothea Dix with the insane, Horace Mann, a Brown graduate with education. And this new, more scientifically based approach influenced Nicholas Brown so that in his will, he left $40,000 to fund the first hospital for the insane in Rhode Island, which is the Butler Hospital we know today. Now, as we learned a few minutes ago, Nicholas's uh, second son, who actually became his heir, John Carter, was not interested in business. And as soon as his father was gone, he pulled away from the family office, which by then was fully centered on manufacturing and focused on what really <coughs> excited him. And that was books and manuscripts on the discovery of the new world and how the old world and the new world influenced each other. And this fascinating question he called the great subject. From the start, he was always adamant that his collection should be accessible to scholars and enlightened amateur from all over the world and he built a fireproof library as an extension to the family house on Benefit Street, and scholars came from all over the world to visit him. He finally married at the age of 62 another book collector, Sophia Augusta Brown, who was actually a descendant of Roger Williams, and they had three children. And now we move to the next great era in American philanthropy, the Gilded Age. In 1870, they were 100 millionaires in America. By 1890, they were 4,047. And by 1916, they were 40,000, with John D. Rockefeller and Henry Ford counted as billionaires. The fortunes of the richest among them have not been equaled, even today, maybe by Jeff Bezos in the last few weeks, but <laughs> it's, very, it's very recent. In 1889, Andrew Carnegie penned an article entitled Wealth, which is probably one of the most famous documents in the history of philanthropy. Carnegie believed that millionaires were not servants of God, but forces of civilization, who had achieved success through a competitive survival of the fittest. He urged his fellow millionaires to use their proven business acumen to, quote, build the ladders on which the aspiring can rise. And these ladders were museums and libraries and universities and scientific institutions, which would allow people to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. The philanthropists of the Gilded Age were the first to hire professional staff to manage the business of benevolence. They were the first to structure their giving along corporate models through foundations. They were among the first to address the root causes of social ills and who believed that the advancement of knowledge and human welfare was their mission. Scientific research therefore became essential. And once again, the Brown family mirrored this development. John Carter Brown's eldest son, John Nicholas, grew up in the middle of the Gilded Age and was strongly influenced by Carnegie's concept of building ladders. He thought long and hard about where his father's collection should go. He wanted it to find a home where it would have the maximum impact possible. And impact is a very 21st century concept, but he was thinking about that already then. He knew that his father cared little for politics and politicians, so he was not going to give the collection to the city of Providence. 
He was very tempted to give it to the Providence Public Library, which in fact was a private library, and was pioneering new methods that are considered standard practice for libraries today, partnerships with schools and museums and corporations, hospitals, and attracting individual readers who were interested in self-education. It was the first library to organize lectures and to purchase books recommended by readers. But in the end, John Nicholas Brown paid for a splendid new building for the Providence Public Library, but his father's collection ended up at Brown University. It was very important that the library, that the John Carter Brown Library, provide a wonderful setting not only for scholarship, but for social gatherings. And that's a wish that my father perpetuated three generations later, as you will see. So now we get to the 20th century with the terrible crises of two world wars and the Great Depression. And for the first time, the American government has to start intervening in solving social issues. But very quickly, the government realized it could not do it alone. So in 1917, charitable contributions became tax deductible. And then in the middle of the century, Lyndon Johnson's Great Society spawned a whole generation of new charities. This then freed up philanthropists to support culture and the arts. And so the focus of the Brown family changed to preservation, culture, and the arts. John Nicholas Brown died suddenly at age 39 in 1900, and his brother Harold died just two weeks later. And so the only heir was a two-month-old baby, my grandfather, who was very much marked by the spirit of the early 20th century. His name was John Nicholas Brown II, and he called himself a professional philanthropist. He believed that art and culture were a vital component of the human experience. He was convinced of the positive impact of great architecture, whether it was centuries old or cutting edge modern. And he paid for the restoration of the Stoa of Attalus in Athens, of a major Byzantine church in Istanbul, but also of the arcade in Providence. And he built uh, a medieval chapel in his old high school, St. George's in Newport, but also the first Bauhaus, modernist house, on the east coast of the United States. He also founded the Providence Preservation Society and Preserve Rhode Island to steward the state's great architectural treasures. And he was the administrative head of, of the Monuments Men, if you've seen the George Clooney movie, as well as assistant secretary of the Navy during which time he was instrumental in desegregating the US Navy. His wife, my grandmother, who was quite a pistol and consulting, was an early female journalist who had a very interesting passion, tin soldiers. And when she married my uh, grandfather, she fell into a tub of butter and on her honeymoon managed to go around Europe collecting tin soldiers. And then one fine day, my grandfather said to her, and how do you know that the uniforms painted on these tin soldiers are accurate? And she said, oh, never thought of that. I'll better start buying books about uniforms. And so she bought and bought and bought. And one fine day, she had the world's largest collection of books and prints on military uniforms. And those are right upstairs along with her tin soldiers. If any of you have never seen them, it's worth going up to check on that. Well, John Nicholas, my grandparents, uh, John Nicholas and Anne, had three children um, who you see here. The eldest, Nicholas, again, my father, by now we're on Nicholas VI, um, a son, a uh, middle son uh, known as Carter, John Carter, and a daughter, Angela. And my father had a 30-year career in the U.S. Navy and then went on to remain in the non-for-profit sector and the National Aquarium in Baltimore, and then came up to run uh, Preserve Rhode Island here in Providence. But one of the great uh, deeds of his, probably the greatest thing he did in his life, was to um, give his um, great-great-great-grandfather's desk, uh, the desk that had been originally made for Nicholas Brown I, uh, to give it to uh, 
allow it to be sold at auction, where it fetched $12 million. At the time, that was the most expensive piece of furniture in the world. And he then used that money to restore our family home, the Nightingale Brown House on Benefit Street, which had originally been purchased by Nicholas II that I've told you about. And then when the house was fully restored, he handed it with an endowment to Brown University. And today it is the Center for Public Humanities for the master's degree program in public humanities. Because my father believes firmly that a conducive environment leads to great scholarship. His brother uh, Carter uh, followed in the family footsteps and became uh, director of the National Gallery of Art at age 34 and used that museum as a platform to really promote the arts in America. And uh, my aunt uh, Angela uh, has uh, been involved in numerous uh, causes and boards here in Rhode Island. So what does this mean for my generation of the Brown family? Well, today's attitudes towards philanthropy are probably best exemplified by the actions of relatively young tech entrepreneurs who are making the $200 million gifts. They see philanthropy as an engine of innovation. They look for underfunded areas. They're willing to take risks, to collaborate. They believe in harnessing market forces to solve social issues, and they measure impact. And interestingly, two of the um, main uh, um, institutions that the Browns have funded in the 20th century have been moved into the 21st century, the John Carter Brown Library and the ASKB Military Collection are now undergoing major digitization programs to make them open source and available to the world. So that's, that's a way that we've brought the 20th century gifts into the 21st century. For my part, I don't have the resources of my ancestors. My house is a lot smaller. <laughs> so I've decided to focus on helping others particularly donors who are not ultra-rich, to help them give more strategically and thoughtfully to make every donor count. And two years ago, as Chris said, I launched a course, a boot camp for smarter donors that I teach in locations around the world. And now I am moving into online education and I will be uh, providing an online version of my course. Uh, recently also, I wrote a book uh, uh, because I felt very fortunate to be able to look back on 10 generations and see how each one coped with the legacy it had inherited. It's not always easy to have such a legacy. One asks a lot of questions. One wonders how responsible one is to the actions of ancestors who lived two, three, four hundred years ago and how to learn from their actions, but to also look at the future and do what one thinks is best to make the world a better place. I hope that in my book, I've been able to illustrate how the history of a family intertwined with the history of an institution can serve to illustrate the story of one of America's most defining characteristics. And that is our belief that we can make the world a better place. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Has any? Yeah, sure. I'm interested in um, your feelings about grappling with um, moral questions that have arisen in your family history just as they have arisen in our country. Mm -hmm. um, and how, how you feel we can move forward and, and not backward um, in addressing those kinds of, that part of our family history as well. Because many of us have that, not just your family. Of course, of course you do. And, and, and that's an important point to make because um, sometimes I get asked your question in a much more aggressive manner. 
and the first thing I say to somebody is the f only difference between you and me is that I know what my ancestors were up to 300 years ago and you're fortunate enough not to. So I appreciate you asking me that question so, so nicely. So personally, obviously, I've had to, to cope with some unpleasant moments in the past 15 years. And I certainly believe in learning from the past and in informing oneself and knowing what the facts were. But then I really think one's energy has to be focused on the future. There are 45 million slaves in the world today. That's far more than they were in the 18th century. And doing something about that, to me, is vitally important. <laughs> and I'm very glad to see that the Center for Slavery and Justice here at Brown is very much focused on modern day slavery and trafficking. And that is where I believe our resources should go. Thank you. Sorry, Rick. I, I, it just makes me think of, uh, so I was wondering how bound you felt. So sometimes the, the past, of course, informs our identity and sometimes it sort of pulls us back or makes, us, it makes it hard to move forward. I know institutionally that's been my experience at various institutions. The longer the history, the known history, the more sort of responsible and sometimes the more backward looking the present institution is, so I find it uh, heartening what you're talking about, uh, which is to kind of um, be proactive and forward-looking and using what you what you can. Uh, but I just, I in reading your book and also hearing you talk, I just wonder how, you know, how that grappling has, uh, uh, what that experience has been like for you. Just, I mean, you've, you've spoken a little bit about it. But. Well, um, I, I should, say full disclosure that Rick and I worked on a small exhibition at the John Carter Brown Library just at the time that the university's report on slavery and justice came out because I felt that that report was very blinkered and focused on just one generation of the Brown family and didn't even have all the facts and so the little exhibition Rick and I worked on together looked at the whole continuum of the Brown family uh, particularly into the 19th century when the university took on the family's name and at the actions of uh, subsequent generations of Brown. So the first step for me that was vitally important was getting the facts straight and trying to dispel the misconceptions that had appeared in the press and, and in um, various publications. And then once I did that, and I, and I did that through this recent book and, and in other ways, but then I really do believe that we have to start looking at, at the problems in the world today and figure out what we're going to do about that. Yeah. So going back to that $44 billion and the $1 billion gifts, and the... Well, I don't know if anybody's made a billion dollar gift to but university, the one, but, know, they, the, the, but they managed year, to yeah. somehow collect yeah. a we're billion dollars. Yeah. 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 Do you, and, and, the, and the, the sense of, I think, the third generation of the Brown family, that, that Rhode Island College or Brown was the, the destination for philanthropy because that was going to be the engine of social change. Mm -hmm. It was going to equip the leaders of, mm -hmm. that these young men were going to go out into the world and try and do something about the chaos and the, and the upheaval that America was going through. Not to force you too far out on a limb, but do you think that universities are living up to that? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, <laughs> is that the, invest is the investment? realizing its potential. I think that if universities can give people the tools they need to analyze and make good decisions and, and explore their values and, and lead a richer life, absolutely. Um, I'm, I have some qualms about how universities are taking certain stances and how pe certain people feel very uncomfortable um, in, uh, in, in universities because they don't feel that there's the freedom of expression uh, that there used to be and, and they feel that they 
um, are not going to be able to express personal opinions. Um, so I think, I think if the university is there to give people the tools they need, um, that's great, uh, and, and equip them to go out into the world and do their part. But if the university becomes, you know, dictates the way people think, that, that gets a bit dangerous. That may be an especially unfair question, given, given the fact that Sylvia is an alumna of the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> I'll let you reach your own conclusion there. Um, thank you, Sylvia, for, uh, for a, a wonderful talk. As you know, this is not the first time that yeah, I've heard the talk. I really but appreciate I always, you coming. I always learn a tremendous amount uh, from the story, perhaps because I, too, struggle every day with figuring out which Nicholas Brown <laughs> I'm talking about. Um, but I was, I was wondering um, how, how you distinguish between the kind of philanthropy of Nicholas Brown um, with respect to what would eventually become Brown University and uh, the kind of philanthropy as represented uh, by somebody like Eliezer Wheelock of Dartmouth College who founded, whose principle was the creation of a, of a university or college for the instruction of Native American uh, students, um, because it seems to me that that is also a very important kind of pedagogical <coughs> brand for social change that's taking place in the late 18th century. Is there a connection between yeah, the two? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and then the two are kind of, I mean, I say Nicholas Brown was sort of groundbreaking in, in certain ways, but we're, we're looking at the very first pioneers. And I say this because most people believe that all this started in the Gilded Age, you know, 50 years later. And I'm trying to show that it actually started uh, earlier, and I'm trying to blow Rhode Island's horn as well, so <laughs> it started here. But no, absolutely. But the other uh, thing I distinguish from, because people all will say to me, oh, but people gave gifts to Harvard, or people built colleges at Oxford. That was very different. Those were acts of charity. Those did not have that strategic, long-term vision um, that we're talking about, that Nicholas Brown had and, and that Dartmouth represented. Um, and that is the difference between charity, which is sort of uh, reactive, spur of the moment, and philanthropy, which is proactive and strategic. I have a question. To what extent do you think people are responsible for the sins of their ancestors. Uh, let me give you some examples. My wife, for example, refuses to eat at the DeWolf Tavern. Um, I argue that the current DeWolfs never engaged in the slave trade, and they serve good food and should eat there. In my own case, my mother's side, <clears throat> which is Rhode Island, um, there were slavers in her past. She um, grew up middle, upper middle class, left me not a penny. Um, <clears throat> so to what extent do I bear some kind of responsibility for the fact that my great, 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 great grandfather was engaged in the slave trade here in Rhode Island? I believe not at all. I believe you, <clears throat> you have to learn about it and then you, have, you are responsible for what you, you are going to do in your life. Um, my, I, my mother is French, and my uh, mother's family are French Huguenots. And I know about ancestors of mine who were enslaved and killed by Catholics. Does that mean that I'm not going to uh, break bread with a Catholic? I mean, the, when, when does it end? Talk to a German, talk to a South African. If we cannot, you know, uh, the buck stops here. If we cannot come to terms with that, and worry about what we're going to do with our lives, I find it, it becomes debilitating. Now that's, for us as individuals, a very different question when you're talking about a nation. And the process that a nation has to go through is, to me, very different because a catharsis has to take place. And so having a dialogue about slavery as a nation is a very different thing, but as an individual, wearing sackcloth and ashes. I mean, I could find, what about my ancestors in the 19th century who employed children in their factories? 
And um, I'm sure in the Middle Ages, my ancestors, I do, don't know anything about them, but I'm sure they did horrible rape and pillaging. And where, where does it end? So we really have to muster our energy. There's so many problems to tackle in the world today. Um, but that's what I believe. Somebody back there. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, American exceptionalism and philanthropy. I, could you expand on that a little bit more, kind of like contrasting it to what is going on in Europe? Yes, of course. Um, I find the uh, looking at the practice of philanthropy around the world quite fascinating because we have a phenomenon happening now in certain developing countries where you have a new middle class and you have billionaires. For example, I was in India last week and you have almost as many billionaires in India as you do in the United States and Mexico and Russia and China and how um, these billionaires are going to be educated to become philanthropists and to leapfrog all the different steps that I recounted to you and to try and become strategic, uh, effective philanthropists in one generation is, is a fascinating conundrum. Europe um, suffers, I'm going to use that word, under two uh, sort of two yokes that have prevented the emergence of, or three rather, that have prevented the emergence of philanthropy in the American uh, model. One is, um, and I don't say this because of my Protestant ancestors, but the Catholic Church has monopolized charitable giving and not allowed the flourishing of, of philanthropy the way we've had it here. The second is the socialist state, which of course uh, with high taxation and, and the impossibility of deducting charitable contributions and the safety net it provides uh, does nothing to encourage uh, individual giving. So that's made things a lot more difficult in Europe. It's just not in the mentalities, particularly in southern Europe, in Italy, Spain, France, um, they just don't think about philanthropy the way we do. Um, and it, it's, it's just an institutional uh, barrier. So to me, I'm much more excited about how we're going to get Mexicans and, and Russians and Chinese and Indians to engage in good strategic philanthropy and to embrace the latest best practice um, and I'm slightly uh, you know, despondent about my fellow Frenchmen, for example. Does, does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I have a quick question or kind of uh, like along the lines of what he said and what she said about how thinking back on the history, and I think I came here as a refugee my people don't have a country, you mm -hmm. know, and so in a sense, we don't have that legacy. We don't have anything to go off of, and anything that I, if I do find, it's someone else writing it for me. And like, whatever, like, I feel like there's so many countries and so many people and so many legacies that actually have skeletons in the closet that they're not willing to talk about, not willing to, because it's like, they already dealt with it, but then, I'm still coming at it where I don't have that access. I don't know my story because someone fudged it up or someone did something to it. And like, even though it's been like 40 years since uh, Vivian um, Moore or like longer, it's just um, just trying to find out more about that. Just trying to get the data from the refugee, like uh, UN, HCR, just like, when was it that I was really born? And I, I don't know, like, what are your thoughts about just letting, I guess, giving out more information, maybe? Or, well, I, I don't know. I find your situation fascinating. And I, and I have to tell you that I was married to a UNHCR official. Um, and um, I, I was posted with UNHCR in a number of places. So I'm quite familiar with the refugee situation and so forth. And um, I think you have the most fantastic quest. You could do so much for your people if you, uh, and it wouldn't be that difficult to, um, to research your, you know, your story. You, you have a great story that's just, and um, I would really encourage you to, to do that. 
Um, it sounds like it would do you a lot of good, and you could yeah. do so much good for your community. Yeah, I just kind of feel like it might, it might start, I don't know, pointing out fingers. And I don't think people might like that, maybe. I don't know. Well, think of what I've just gone through, right? If I could do it, you could do it. Um, the, are you Vietnamese? No, I'm mom. You're mom, right. Yeah. Mom, right. Um, yeah, I, I, would, I would love to. You know, let's stay in touch. I'd love to help you with that. Um, it's so important because then you'll be able to move forward. Yeah, actually, that was one thing where I, I feel like minorities. They, I feel like because they don't really, they grew up at least in America learning about all this history, but mm -hmm. nothing about themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like they go more into the humanities because they do want to know more about themselves. Mm -hmm. And so now they can't like thinking about. Because I think you have to separate the two if you want to go into the STEM fields. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot harder because it's like, I want to know about myself. I want to know about my culture. But that takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if I learned that and I was confident and I knew my backstory and I knew all that, I feel like I would be able to just like, okay, now I, I got this. And I can just go forward and I can learn whatever I need to learn. Absolutely. I would really encourage you to do that. And I bet you'd already find resources here in Providence, and then now, you know, with internet and everything, you it would not be too too difficult. So, what a great quest, really! I really applaud you and encourage you. Okay, well, um, I guess we're going downstairs.